multiple disasters. Now, I'm meant to multitask here, so I'm keeping my eyes open for anyone that wants to ask questions, that's fine. I think you can stream some questions and I'm going to be able to see them somewhere down here, maybe. Um, and I've got some questions of my own, one of which I, I asked uh, um, I asked Kareem there, but I, I've got some others. And, and um, I might just ask Norma, um, we've talked about institutions, we've talked about hospitals, we've talked about pre-hospital services. Um, what's the role of the public in helping manage the consequences of a mass casualty incident. I'm aware that there are programs run in the US called Stop the Bleed, and I think we have uh, uh, that program running to some degree here. What's the role of the public in a mass casualty? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Working? Yeah, great. Um, very important, actually, Ian, because they are the first on scene. And certainly with the 15th of March <laughs> incident, um, knowing that it was um, 10 minutes, um, you know, before we could um, get um, our responders in there safely. And we know, and having spoken to several members of the public um, shortly after that event, um, they were absolutely key. So clearly St. John and ambulance services are keen to um, actually engage with first aid, public first aid training. And I'm certainly aware of uh, St. John actually in the UK that have already started um, that first aid training um, for uh, gunshot wounds and stab wounds, which I think reflects um, the level of the risk that's in the UK. And clearly it's, it's very sad that here in New Zealand that we need to be looking to do something similar. So absolutely, they are, they are first on scene. Um, they are the first ones, not only there to treat the patients, but actually to give us that vital information when they're also doing, placing those first calls. Thank you. Now we heard a bit from Kareem about surge capacity and that and that slope and the resistance and the challenge. I was interested in your comments about uh, about burnout because it's that it's that inability to to cope with the fact that you're not doing what you normally do that can can stimulate PTSD and burnout in people. But a question for David Mates: Where are we, or where is Canterbury DHB, for example, on that on that curve? Uh, it seemed like on on the theoretical curve that Kareem put up, five patients an hour um, put you well. You know, started to fall like uh, oxygen desaturation. You were off the edge and going well down very quickly. But you had like 50 patients in an hour or something like that a while ago, you would have been minus, you would have been below the line. What is the surge capacity of Canterbury DHB and how did you manage that sort of load? Well, I think part of um, what was touched on before about, you know, kind of things like command, command and control, um, that doesn't play a part um, in anything. And the, the basis of an emerging situation where you already have full operating um, theatres, full ED, working, you know, kind of the normal day, is the sense of starting to make choices and decisions about a number of individuals that have got a range of different uh, different trauma. And I think part of the, the key to that is, again, enabling key decision makers, key clinical leaders to do their job. And a core part of that is actually how to clear out. And one of the things in, I think, in mass casualty events, you need a whole system to work for a whole system to work. Um, some of the, you know, some of the most important parts of the response in Canterbury were actually medical wards or cardiac unit taking patients out of ED to create and enable capacity to um, to be created. And an interesting bit, I think that's been. Uh, one of the challenges of people in other services sometimes feeling as though they haven't been directly involved in managing trauma and yet the very act of doing that enabled capacity be, to be created. And I think the other bit is actually a well um, you know, kind of a well developed plan where um, um, everyone's roles are clearly understood and it's very clear in terms of um, you know kind of then you know the director of is not their barking orders, but actually enabling and ensuring the right teams are matched with the various patients coming through. But 50 patients to turn up in just under an hour with um, you know, kind of uh, you know, um, significant gunshot wounds is something you don't plan for, or we haven't planned for. But I think part of the ability to cope with that is actually people knowing their roles and 
Um, and that's right through from whether that ED specialists, nursing, social workers, um, orderlies, um, clerical staff buried in the middle of actually capturing, you know, kind of uh, key, you know, kind of key data, all of those actually enable capacity to be created. Thank you. One of the original titles I think we started off for this session was how do you plan for the unplannable? And, and you've reflected on that. Um, talking to Leanne before, she reminded me of the role of the council in the health sector, which is probably something that we don't often think about. So Leanne, what preparations can the council take to prepare for the unimaginable mass casualty situation? So I, I just thought that I would use the example of uh, what happened in Christchurch before the earthquakes happened. So uh, there was a small outbreak of H1N1 uh, in the Aranui area. Uh, and uh, so there had been a lot of work uh, going on in that community in relation to, um, you know, the need for cleaning hands and uh, food preparation, care and all of those things. Uh, all of the material that went out uh, around the different uh, toilets and in the schools and different places were all, were all Christchurch City Council signs. And that's because of the collaboration that had happened between the DHB, the Health Promotion Unit, the, um, the schools and, and local community groups. So it was quite a joined up activity. And as a result, uh, we didn't have um, an epidemic. And we could have had a major outbreak of H1N1 because there had been the small one, but it was contained. And that meant that we were actually on very good footing when it came to responding after the earthquakes. And I always remind people that we were um, three weeks, I mean, where I lived in Bexley, uh, just down the road from the Aranui, we were three weeks without power uh, and um, you know, water, fresh water and uh, wastewater. So it was drinking water and wastewater. There was not, there was no outbreak of food or waterborne disease um, in the east after the earthquakes, and that, in my view, was actually uh, based on a lot of the preparation that had gone on before. And I know that um, you know, just as a local member of parliament at the time. Uh, whenever I went into town for a briefing, I just picked up hand sanitizer and just distributed it everywhere. You could not eat even a barbecued sausage without somebody <laughs> pouring hand sanitizer over your hands before you took hold of your piece of bread and your sausage. So, um, so there was a real understanding of, of what needed to happen in order to stay safe in that environment. So the preparation, it's not so much the preparation, it's the fact that you know, and they always use that expression, it's not the plan that matters, it's the planning. And it's actually the capability of coming together, recognizing um, pre-existing capabilities, not from just the um, organization, but from the community. So the community always have existing strengths and capabilities. And sometimes we forget that that's actually where all of this begins. So, mm -hmm. so that's, I think, very much um, a collaborative role um, involving the council, but not exclusively. Yeah, thank you. Um, coming, coming down now to the providers of care, I think it's widely um, reflected both in New Zealand and internationally that the surgical teams involved in, in caring for patients recently and in the earthquakes did exceptionally well here in, in Christchurch. And a question for, for Chris, has your training in surgery prepared you for your role or did you need additional training? Um, how would you regard surgical training as a preparation for handling mass casualty disasters? I think our general surgical training scheme does a good job in establishing the general principles for teaching and treating patients. Uh, the mass casualty event is, I think, I was lucky with March, I had Greg Robertson who's at the back there, who helped out and led us in how to treat and uh, maintain the flow of the hospital, not the actual individual patients. I think it's, as David said, clearing out. We were lucky we created capacity the whole time by clearing out to the medical wards, moving everyone out of the emergency department. We moved people upstairs into our recovery room, creating space again, and that allowed us to see patients and have timely team uh, space for the teams to actually treat the patients and make that next move 
clear. But yes, I think the general surgical training scheme is up to it. The DSTC training program, uh, we, you know, three day course, which all our trainees and all our surgeons do, establishes a good principle for how to treat the trauma patient. I suspect, though you haven't flagged it specifically, but I suspect as surgical graduates, we, we do focus very much on treating patients and the capability to treat patients rather than what Kareem has highlighted, which is maintaining the capability of the organization to treat what we don't know about yet, you know, what may come in. Yes, that was the, that was the, it was a bit scary because the flood of patients kept coming and we didn't know when they were going to finish coming. And I think the earthquake had set us up that to create the space was the, the key to, to allow the, the whole system to work. And all the teams worked well together, the emergency physicians, the anaesthetists came down mm. and we were lucky because it was the change over time. So there was quite often two, there was two sets of nursing staff in the emergency mm. at the same time. So there was plenty of staff to work as a team. Now, I'm not trying to monopolize things. This is good, Sammy got their, their hands up um, because this is an open forum. So it's open for questions from, from the audience and obviously from panelists to other panelists, should they require. So yeah, question down the back. Um, so I'm Alison, I'm a pediatric surgeon here in Christchurch. Um, I've got a question for Kareem. What in your hospital, if any, do you do for simulation for mass casualty events? And how do you, if you do do it, get buy-in from staff because in my experience of simulation in both Australia and in the UK was we just couldn't get buy-in for staff for mass casualty event practices. So um, I think it, so when you, when you sim, the key question is what are you simming for? And for most, um, for most of the things that you need, big exercises are not helpful um, and they take a lot of staff time They're very expensive for a hospital, very difficult um, to organize. And actually they don't test very much. Um, you know, we, we, I think we've been in our new hospital since 2012 uh, and we have done one major hospital simulation uh, of a mass casualty event. And that was, uh, about 18 months ago. Um, so why do you, why do you sim? You sim to test comms, uh, and you sim to test scenarios that you haven't come across. Um, and tabletops tend to be very good for that type of simulation. You sim to see whether you've got enough resources. You know, have you got enough syringe drivers? Have you got enough ventilators? Have you got enough chest drains? Um, you can do that in quiet times with, um, you know, taking box, you know, with a sheet of mocked up patients and you take the boxes out for each patient and you get rid of them and say, what have I got left? Uh, you know, and then you say, oh, well, we can just get more ventilators from ICU and I say, I don't think so, you know, <laughs> so we're using ours. So, you know, so you can do that without the big sim. So, you know, really in these big whole hospital sims, you're not testing trauma care. You're not really testing about whether people turn up or not. You're not really testing about, you know, whether they go to the right place or not. Maybe you're testing overcrowding. Maybe you're testing how to manage um, crowds. They do pick out certain things that you may not have picked up before, but they tend to be relatively subtle. And I think that's the reason why you don't get buy-in into these big things because the, the learnings from them are not obvious and they're not fed back. Um, to people very well. So I think if you do sim, it has to be for a very clear reason after you've done the other things, uh, if you like. This probably doesn't answer your question. Norma, um, we've heard a bit about surge capacity for hospitals and that graph, which is now burned in our mind, five patients an hour, that's when we start the slippery slope and we're down the... So that's for, so that, that's number one, it's a model. <laughs> put, and you put your hospital's capability into the model yeah. to get your and the other thing is that 100% is an arbitrary concept and you know where you fall down the slope and how you fall down the slope is different really so I would not put five in your mind at all what I would say is there is a slope, slope yeah. to the curve and you 
you have to be able to move down a certain way down that curve comfortably. And because you've discussed before, how do you keep the blood stops going? You should get a CT. That's good. So that's at the hospital level. No, no, I, 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 you're absolutely right. I was, I was making a, an overly simplified approach to it. But, but how, what's the surge capacity of the pre-hospital care? I mean, where does the ambulance service get over? Where is their cut point between standard care and less than standard care? And how do you help maintain the level that you decide is acceptable? Mm. Obviously, we, we are, in a sense, awaiting, awaiting service. So you never know you, um, what sort of um, demand could suddenly you could be faced with. But we, we already plan for a predicted, the Saturday nights, the Friday nights, etc., in your highly populated area. But clearly the, the, inf the importance of getting the information really quickly about the number of casualties and the scale and the nature is really important because there are, there are a lot of people um, that um, uh, in, you know, in roles um, that would then become available. So there is a clinical workforce that is sitting within other, other roles and doing other things, if you like, at that same time. So everyone then just comes together. And I think for um, the 15th of March, I think we had something like 117 people overall that were involved, either I think 18 ambulances, um, you know, managers um, and people just come together. And certainly in St. John, there are a lot of people, even in other parts and other departments that have actually have, have been trained first responder so you just it, it is amazing in the way that ambulance services just just do that and yeah. it's also interesting that um, in the media and the the impact and then you often get a dip in demand um, from your normal population so they, they suddenly realize it's not a good time to ring um, <laughs> but yeah it, it, so so that's how that's how you do it now it's very much it would be very much more challenging in rural communities mm. or or outside of a city setting, I think, for any, any country. Okay. So there are other ways that you manage it, of course, as well. You know, you, um, not taking walking wounded to hospital or not taking them straight away is part of how you manage your, your vehicles, you know, putting them in a bus instead or setting up clearing stations in hospitals, you know, maybe not putting up IVs on people, um, you know, and, or, or you know, limiting you, but there are there are all sorts of ways that pre-hospital service is also damage control apart from just staff. David, thinking about resources wider than just one DHB, obviously uh, mass casualty situations have the risk of overwhelming the DHB resources. Is there a national plan to bring resources from other DHBs to be available to one that might be overwhelmed? Well, it's an interesting one. Um, the worst possible thing when you've got an emerging situation and a disaster playing out is everyone from outside wanting to help. And it creates and adds to chaos. And it was fascinating, you know, kind of a um, couple of hours um, after the, um, you know, kind of 50 gunshot wounds had turned up in terms of, um, so where are you accessing your trauma surgeons? And, you know, um, there's an interesting concept in terms of the sense of, well, if we were waiting to access trauma surgeons from somewhere else, um, there wouldn't be too many people that um, survived. So there's an element of um, um, an emerging situation, allowing emerging situation to emerge before people just trying to jump into other solutions and answers. Um, through the process um, here, 50 casualties, and again, uh, we had no preventable um, deaths that are, you know, kind of that occurred from that. Um, however, we had a challenge with ICU capacity, and part of the ICU teams, in terms of the networks around the country, looked at actually some of the stable ICU patients that we already had to be able to be shifted um, out to other, you know, kind of other units, and that's where a national support becomes really important. But I think what is um, often not understood is you need and you can only manage situations from the situation to make the call. And too often, I think, in uh, mass casualty events, you start getting um, external agencies wanting to, um, you know, kind of wanting to exert um, themselves into that as opposed to their role of supporting and enabling. 
this is what we require. Um, can you help make it happen? Not in terms of, well, actually, we've got all these experts that need to come in and do X, Y, Z. And I think that is often where um, trauma or mass casualty or major events start going wrong, is not supporting and enabling the teams um, you know, kind of that are already, um, already in place. Leanna, so since March 15th, is there anything in particular that the council has done to um, like prepare for a future unplannable event? Is there any particular changes or activities that the council's done? Um, yes, we, we, we work collaboratively with the other agencies and um, I mean, David's played a lead role in pulling uh, all of the agencies together so that we are meeting, well, we were meeting weekly for some time after the events uh, and also um, now meeting monthly just so that we can build an understanding of lessons learned but also uh, ensure that we've got better practices um, going through. But I, I'm just following on from what David said is that um, never underestimate the capacity to feel an urgent sense of need for the government to take control of a situation and um, insert themselves over the top of what should be a locally led um, response and and should be a locally led recovery. Um, I mean, I, I just use this as an example from the earthquakes. Uh, you know, to set up a, a, a government department in Christchurch to lead its recovery. I mean, I can say this, I wasn't the mayor at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, the, um, the, the decision to do that um, is so undermining and disruptive of existing relationships between agencies that have to work collaboratively um, in, in times of BAU, situation normal, and absolutely must continue to operate um, in uh, times of response and recovery. So uh, I think if there's a lesson learned, you look to your local organisations for, um, for that, uh, for the models of relationships that already work and build on those, because that's what's going to be there once the dust settles and, uh, and you don't want to have an outside agency because when it goes, what is left in its wake? Um, you've got to spend your time rebuilding those local relationships. So um, I think that the, what we've picked up on is that the essence of communication, the need for a single source of truth, information that is accessible, consistent and reliable, uh, and, um, and, and that's why I think the multi-agency uh, capacity to respond has to be locally led in order to ensure that that information is available and it's not being filtered for any other reason. Um, often when you're in that situation, I think we're going to learn a few lessons from what's happened on this occasion, but when you've got set government departments all operating in silos and they all have dif different rules that apply in different sets of circumstances. Um, sometimes that single source of truth is, is not the comforting um, piece of information, but it can become a gathering place for information that should feed into very quick and much more responsive um, policy changes to enable things to happen um, a lot more quickly. So I guess that's what we've learned is that we have a role from a city perspective um, to be that um, conduit for both information in and out. Thank you. Now, I think there was a question down the back somewhere. No? Okay, we must have answered it already. Um, I, I, I had a question for Kareem, and I, we're getting close to the, to the time we've finished, so if there are any questions out there, please uh, put your hand up now. Um, we, we talked, or you mentioned the, the moral injury type situation, the burnout type situation. What is the optimal debris, you know, how do we prevent staff that have been through these? I, I suspect that being part of events like this actually helps the process, talking through what's happened in various events. But what what is the ideal, and in your experience from the various um, mass casualty situations, how do we help people get through events like this and re maintain their um, ability to work in this environment? 
yeah, so I think there's staff and there's also um, uh, direct witnesses. Um, and actually, if you start to involve the public in stop the bleed type programs, you know, and things, you know, it's, it's estimated there was something like 5,000 witnesses to the Westminster Bridge attack alone. Um, and, you know, many of whom are visiting London. So, uh, so staff are uh, interesting. I think um, what we realize now is that um, you don't need a mass casualty event for staff to be, to feel like they've not done right for a patient or that they you know or that they're constant relenting things that they they're faced with so i think most um hospitals in uh england now have programs for staff wellness and, and well-being like trim programs uh and things interestingly after uh, the london bombings especially uh, which were more out with our day-to-day -day work than the terrorist attacks which were kind of blunt or penetrating trauma the explosive things um we're a bit more out with our normal day-to-day -day practice. The people who who really developed PTSD were the ones who either had a vacation booked immediately after the event or were to rotate out to a different hospital. Uh, and so they didn't have the chance to go to the pub, talk things through with colleagues, you know, um, laugh hysterically and you know the, that sort of you know the personal debrief uh of the event i think is you know hot and cold debriefs are, are fine but i think you know different people come to the crunch points at different times and they need the people around them who've also lived that experience because you can't take it home um you know so i, I think it was it was definitely about especially supporting people who were one reason or another could not be with their colleagues in the ensuing weeks. For, um, for witnesses um, and bystanders and things, we now try to collect the names and details of every witness. Uh, and then they're supposed to go into a screening program where their GP is, uh, or somebody has sent a letter to screen, or, or they themselves maybe, texted or something, a very short psychological screen at about three months uh, and then referred to local psychological services if, if need be. But that's obviously a very difficult um, thing and, you know, there's always funding issues with that, that sort of thing. But definitely there's a real bystander issue that needs to be got to grips with as well as staff. David? I think one of the um, unique and major challenges that we face within the you know, kind of the Canterbury Health System, and when I talk about the Canterbury Health System, that's the broader element, whether it be um, St John's, whether that be you know, kind of police, whether that in fact be um, you know, kind of primary care, aged care, and, and community is is um, probably our biggest concern is got is the ongoing wellness of those that work within the system. And part of that has been the prolonged period of stress that this community has been under from a um, series of um, earthquakes to pandemics, to fires, to floods, to the Kaikoura um, you know, kind of earthquakes, um, through to um, uh, you know, kind of the um, you know, kind of the you know, kind of the mass shooting um, here. And then the following assault from that has been this last winter where we have been overflowing everywhere. So one of the elements is people's ability to have the time to recover. And I think what we're finding is actually there's an underlying resilience starting to drop over the long term on the basis of actually people actually being able to rejuvenate and have the headspace and, and, um, and the ability to um, get to a, different, uh, you know, to a different normal. I was reflecting two years ago, we still had 2,000 of our staff were still dealing with EQC and insurance issues um, seven years after mm. earthquakes, and that's what they come to work with and into an environment where we're masters at shifting and moving um, people with um, construction and, and disruption. So I think we've got some quite significant and ongoing challenges as a area and a um, set of services of how we continue to keep and build that underlying resilience again and uh, the underlying wellness. I think some of the importance, particularly after the mass shooting too, the formal debriefs and those sort of things, they're a really important part, but actually the stories. And what's really important to us, 
with an event, people become consumed and know a lot about what they were doing, but often don't have a sense of the whole. And that the, the element of people to be able to tell their stories has been a really important part of people trying to make sense of um, all the different elements that, um, you know, kind of that have happened. Um, you know, 50 um, uh, deceased were also handled through Christchurch Hospital and buried down in the bowels of the hospital. A whole set of processes with radiology, CT scanning, all of those done within um, something like 18 hours um, in terms of um, just organised, sorted and those sort of things. But quite invisible, A, for those people working there, what was happening elsewhere, but also elsewhere in the system, people understanding what was going on in other parts. So that sense of storytelling and enabling people, but the massive pressure that we all have is to get back to business as usual. And if there's one thing is I hate the term business as usual. <laughs> I remember that, David. Um, now, was there another question down here? No? On the computer. Oh, I should finally look at the computer. <laughs> Um, I guess this is a this probably would be a wrap up question for everyone. Um, uh, it's a what one thing question. Um, what one thing going forward will assist managing these events in the future for your organisation? So, if there was if there was one thing that you were going to do differently, maybe we start with Norma, go along that way, and came back to Kareem. If there's one thing you would do differently, or one thing that would help you in the future. Uh, I think that there were obviously lessons, lessons learnt, and although um, I think we did well with the, the staff support, I think there was something around that immediate staff support that we would do differently, where we would not um, think for people, if you like, and say, right, we're gonna, um, we're gonna, you're going to go and stop, um, and um, we're going to make you rest, when actually I was hearing that a lot of people wanted to, to carry on. Um, and I think we have to empower our people so they make those decisions. What do you now want to do? Um, rather than imposing, um, we think you've seen enough, we're going to make you stop and do such and such. So I think that's what I would do differently. Okay. Chris, one thing different? I'd like a better communication system. <laughs> <laughs> Because most of us heard about it via, not the BBC here, but by website notifications on our phone. So if we could enable a better communication system so the staff could be uh, alerted to a situation, maybe better than, I mean, everyone came in, so it all worked, but it doesn't seem that reliable to rely on notifications from the webs. David, a, a one thing. Um, it was interesting operating a emergency response with a police lockdown mm -hmm. and that was absolutely in your experience and and kind of worked because of the relationships were there but i think that is something where we're needing to rethink through what does it mean because at the early stages there was a sense that there was a live shooter within the hospital um, as well so there was a series of other events that were playing out while at the same time um you know kind of the um shootings at the mosque um, yeah, kind of we're also playing out and I think that's one of the elements again of how you do that because once you get into a total lockdown the ability for staff to get in and out and public to get in and out just poses some interesting challenges and conundrums. Um, we made it work but I think it's something that uh, we're needing to uh, kind of reflect on for you know, kind of foreseeable um, instances how you continue to manage in that environment. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know that I'm helpful in this regard because my experience was not of the emergency in a hospital setting. But um, from a community point of view, um, we, uh, we instinctively knew on the Friday night, and we were in the lockdown ourselves, um, we instinctively knew that people would want to come and show their solidarity and support. So we nominated a place where people could come uh, what I hadn't anticipated was that the media, the international media, would 
would set up there as well. And it couldn't have been a better location because the international image was of the response, which was where the tributes, the, the peace and the love and the compassion. And the one thing that I wish that I'd known before um, is our Muslim community is so much better than, than I did. And I know them so much better now, but the incredible capacity for forgiveness was, the, um, was something that, um, that has been an inspiration, I think, to us all uh, in terms of our ability to cope with what is um, still uh, a, a, an event that we cannot come to terms with because it should never have happened here. But because of this incredible expression that came from the affected communities, uh, we were able to um, claim, I think on the world stage, um, the um, a, a way of responding that just simply hasn't been seen to that extent before and it was quite um, overwhelming and will lead to real change in the world. So that's what I wish I'd known before. Final word from Karim. Um, so I'm going to do four things. <laughs> 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 Only because that's what we're doing in London and it, I think it... So um, one is bystander response, um, which I think is clear that it's uh, that's absolutely um, key. Um, the second is police, um, working with the police, um, both for police bystander works, but also hot zone working, um, as David said. One is trying to realign clinical care with the planners and trying to meet in the middle somewhere about so that there's more cohesion between the planners, the crisis management planners and the clinicians. Uh, and the other thing that which we are being told to plan for is a true mass casualty event. Um, so London, for example, is being told to prepare for events which might be, you know, a stadium, a mass terrorism event where there are, say, 500 um, P1 um, casualties and 1,000 um, P2s. Uh, and um, essentially what that means is we have to prepare staff to fail and fail properly you know, be so overwhelmed that people will die in the hospitals. And so how do you, how do we prep for prep institutions and prep staff to fail in ways that they've not failed before and come out on the end of it? Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I, it's just some, some thoughts for us to take away and in in, uh, under the heading of mass casualty events, that's for sure. Thank you very much for our panelists for coming along and, uh, uh, giving us the benefit of your uh, wisdom and your experiences. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, David Mates, for coming the day after he's got back from overseas. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Norma, coming from Auckland. And of course, thank you to Kareem for contributing a day that he would otherwise have off somewhere pleasant, I'm sure, to come.